what I did in my poking around was I found that um, for both alcohol and cannabis, there is national codes or restrictions as well as provincial, whereas for gambling, there's only provincial regulations or restrictions that I could find. Um, and in comparing those, I identified some ways in which we could learn from what is happening or what has been restricted for cannabis and alcohol that could potentially inform some of the things that we could consider doing for gambling. Uh, hello, everyone. Coming to you from the Gambling and Risk Taking Conference in Las Vegas. It's the first time in four years because COVID caused a delay. Otherwise, it'd be every three years. And today's guest is Dr. Sasha Stark from Canada. Dr. Stark, or today, Sasha, welcome. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your work and where you're from? Sure. So I'm the Director of Research and Evidence Services at GRIO, Evidence Insights, or GRIO for short. And so we're a nonprofit organization that focuses on knowledge translation. Um, we work internationally. We've been around for over 20 years doing a lot of different knowledge translation, research commissioning, um, core research as well. And we focus not only on gambling, but also on kind of related areas. So cannabis, um, financial literacy, kind of broader um, well-being topics. And your presentations have been interesting at the conference. Uh, one area of research is how addictive personalities, say to cannabis or alcohol, maybe they mirror certain areas of gambling or there may be some overlap that we can learn from addiction to either cannabis or alcohol and apply that to problem gambling. Is that right? So I looked at um, advertising specifically related to kind of those three areas. Um, so alcohol, cannabis, and gambling because um, there's reason to, to believe they're not ordinary commodities, the three of them. So they can be engaged at, at low levels um, at low and have low risk as a result, but at high levels do have societal impacts. So that's why I looked at the three kind of together comparable because of those similarities. And so what I did was in the province of Ontario, so we've had a lot of changes recently in our gambling availability in the country of Canada and the province of Ontario specifically with um, expansion of single event sports betting as well as the opening of the online gambling market to independent operators. So there's a lot of interest in advertising that has resulted from those expansions in the province and the country where there's a lot of kind of public interest and outcry around advertising. There, there is regulation around advertising for cannabis and alcohol, yes? Yes. And is there also regulation around advertising for gambling? There is, yes. And so what I did in my poking around was I found that um, for both alcohol and cannabis, there's national codes or restrictions as well as provincial, whereas for gambling, there's only provincial regulations or restrictions that I could find. Um, and in comparing those, I identified some ways in which we could learn from what is happening or what has been restricted for cannabis and alcohol that could potentially inform some of the things that we could consider doing for gambling. What were some of the key takeaways I from think this research? I think some of them, well, there was a couple kind of um, across different areas. So one was around volume. So for cannabis in Canada, you can't publicly advertise cannabis. So you can have broad messaging. You can have kind of targeted once you have someone in your shop or something like that, um, but you can't have broad-based advertising. So that was kind of one interesting question was, there's a lot of countries doing that, banning advertising for gambling completely. Is that something we should be thinking about? So this is kind of, I essentially generated a bunch of questions for the audience and people that work in the field to think about, and that was one. Um, there was another one also around um, inducements and sponsorships. So kind of these formats of, of advertising. So sponsorships are not permitted at all for cannabis. So you can't sponsor um, athletes, you can't sponsor events, um, facilities, and you also can't offer inducements at all. So in gambling in Ontario, um, sponsorship is allowed as well as inducements. Though in, in Ontario, there's an interesting way that they've done it where it's not public inducements. You can't advertise them broadly, only once the gambler is, or the, the person who gambles is in the gambling ecosystem. So once they're on the platform or have opted in. So that raised, um, looking at uh, cannabis specifically raised those questions around what should we not be allowing sponsorship? Should we not be allowing inducements potentially for gambling? This could be a deep dive, but just those ideas being shared must make some people uncomfortable in regard to gambling, but it's food for thought. Yes, exactly. And it challenges uh, the way that things are being done currently. The other presentation you had 
was related to data. Yes and gambling. Can you tell us about that? Sure, so that one was not a full presentation, it was kind of a five minute um, pitch on the topic, and so the one I chose was open data, because at um, GRIO we have, uh, we're a knowledge translation organization, so we really focus on making um, knowledge, um, research knowledge data available as publicly as we can. So we have, um, we have an online digital library that has over 5,000 gambling resources in it made widely available, and that includes um, research summaries as well as data sets. And so one of the things we're trying to do is see how can we support the field and encourage the field around the question of data, and open data is one way to do that. So for example? So for example, it would be, um, so a lot of, a lot of researchers conduct their own um, surveys and then analyze that data and then that remains theirs. And so in some, a lot of people are moving towards op open science mm -hmm. principles where they're doing pre-registration, so telling people in advance the research they're gonna do, making the publication open access so it's not behind a $50 paywall. And also, also that includes often sharing the variables in a data set that have been analyzed. And a way to go beyond that is to share the entire data set with others so it can be reproduced, so the research can be assessed to support the research process. And the main pitch that I made at the very end was to push the industry um, towards open data. So researchers are moving in this direction, so pushing them as well. And data, are, um, in industry is often working with kind of individual people or research departments in providing kind of data for analysis, but encouraging potentially those researchers or those industry people who are, have data and are able to provide it, um, encouraging them to provide it and to do so as openly as possible for the benefit of the field. So of, you know, all of, all of the stakeholders in this space. So for those of you watching and listening, that are controlling the data. You're hearing from researchers that are saying, let us have it with and less barriers. Exactly, and it's for kind of the public interest, it's really, public right? Interest. It's for, you know, it's in everyone's ability to um, identify the things mm. that cause people to have higher risk and mm. to help them s reduce those risks and support with that information. So the more broadly we make that information for those to, to look at it and use it, the better outcomes for the people who play, which is who we're all interested in. Next question. Um, okay, so we heard from Alan Feldman in the previous episode. Um, and for those of you uh, watching or listening, you can look that up. It's either one or two episodes ago. Um, but he said that we're not necessarily successful in the US in regard to responsible gaming programs, that they're making progress. And he lists some reasons why they're not quite successful and there's a long ways to go. So this is really more candid, more informal from your gut as a researcher. What do we need to do to make more progress with responsible gaming programs? Maybe right, maybe wrong, yeah. but it's just something you feel that we need to do X, Y, Z. I think one thing um, that we can try to do is to not reinvent the wheel where we don't have to. So in a lot of cases, there's jurisdictions that are more mature in us than us in certain ways that we can look to. So if we think of sports betting, like the UK and Australia, they've had uh, uh, sports betting for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So there's things that we can learn from those jurisdictions um, in, in what we're doing now. Um, one way to do that could be, there's a, there's a graph that we often um, refer to in, in our work um, that is originally from cannabis, but essentially looks at how harms are related to the type of market. So essentially a uh, completely commercialized market is on one end and prohibition is on the other and there's a U-curve where the harms are the highest at both ends, and lowest in the middle where there's kind of that balanced regulation. So I think one way to do that is preventative. So if we, when we're legalizing new forms, when we're developing um, new regulations, is to try to look for that middle balanced regulation to help us have the infrastructure to work within, because things like digital tools and messaging and that type of thing are going to be most effective in that, um, in that type of system. Mm -hmm. That middle ground, most effective in regard to advertising also. Yes. Mm. Sasha, any final words uh, to share before we say uh, farewell? Yes, so I think um, building on, like you were saying, Alan's talk and some of the, the things that I have spoken to today, I think my main plug would be around um, purposeful evaluation of the work that we're doing, um, building that in from the beginning. So if we're developing, um, if we're gonna develop some messaging and roll them out, if we're gonna create a new digital tool for Blair to use, if we're gonna offer a new um, type of limit that we, or did, you know, um, 
a pre-commitment tool that they can use is to think about evaluation from the start. So what is, what is the key question that we're trying to get at? Who are we trying to help and how? And then doing that evaluation piece to bring that full circle. And those, those things that I talked about previously in terms of having that open data um, and, and considering what it is that we're comparing things against, I think that can really help us to have this, this really purposeful lens on developing the things we're doing intentionally and then completing that full circle um, in learning from them. For someone who studies advertising, the strip is right behind us. If you were gonna place a big billboard related to responsible gambling up on the strip, what would that billboard say? Well, I can't tell you right now because of the evaluation um, kind of framework where the first step of that would be to go to those people to, to find out from the people that we would want to be targeting um, in this area. Would it be people who are of low risk or higher risk? Would it be a certain demographic? Um, would it be a certain uh, someone who plays a certain game? Mm. And finding out what resonates with them, what type of mm. wording, what type of imaging. Focus group. Exactly, do that kind of preliminary work sure. to make sure we're, we're doing something intentional um, and eliminating unintended consequences as much as possible. Mm. So that's not the most um, direct soundbite answer Answer, but I feel like that's a very researcher answer <laughs> to get you to that question. So as a researcher, is there any book that you gift most often to friends or family? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, on the top, I mean, <laughs> I wrote a book 10 years ago. <laughs> so that often is the easiest one that I plug to people because it's, um, it's work that I've done before. But there's a lot of um, ones done recently. Um, there was actually one done in, um, or there's been a couple that have been ethno ethnographies kind of in Vegas of slot machines and that kind of thing. So there's a couple of those um, that I would probably encourage people to read. Mm -hmm. Those uh, those on the ground ones I think are the most interesting to kind of pull people in to um, get an idea of what the, the people who are playing are experiencing and then some of the factors um, more broadly in the gambling kind of system that are influencing them. Where do people find you? Twitter, LinkedIn, or? Yes, I'm on Twitter, Sasha Stark, PhD. I'm on LinkedIn as well, and my email is super easy, sasha at creo.ca if you want to reach out. And those links will be in the description to this episode. Everyone, farewell from Las Vegas. Thanks for listening to the No Line Podcast, hosted by Philip Beer. For a complete list of past episodes, visit iTunes or www.nolinepodcast.com. That's www.nolinepodcast.com. The No Line Podcast is committed to responsible, responsible gaming. gaming. The No Line Podcast is a Philip James Media production.